All right, let's get into our study in the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter number three. As you all may know, this is my favorite chapter of my favorite book of the Bible. Uh, it's hard to have a favorite, but as you grow, uh, I remember the first book that was my favorite was the book of Galatians because it taught the difference between law and grace. And then it became Ephesians showing God's uh, 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 great love to us. Um, but I can't say... I can't say anything about God's Word without understanding the book of Romans, which is the first real understanding I had from God's Word from Jim Kirkwood in Chicago or in Bensonville, Illinois. He, he, he taught me the gospel of grace and who Paul was through, through Romans chapter 3. They all hold a special part. But in my life, as I progressed in my edification and understanding, Philippians, and Krista can say this too, this is one of our favorite books, if not the favorite, uh, and the chapter that does it for me is the chapter number three, where he starts with finally. So we've been looking at this issue of the true circumcision. Uh, we've only seen verses one and two, so let's look at that. Look at Philippians chapter number three, verse one. See, he says finally. So of the four chapters, Paul is going to now wrap up the book. And the thing he wraps it up with is this issue of what it means to be a joint heir with Christ. It's all about that. That, that uh, look, look at chapter number three. And uh, look it down in verse, you can look at verse 9. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. It's about the faith of Christ. Uh, Christ means to suffer and then to have glory. Look at verse number 12. Not as though I have already attained. Well, attaining what? What is Paul after 30 years uh, trying to attain? Either we're already perfect or, or completely spiritually mature. He says, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Why did the Lord Jesus Christ apprehend Paul 30 plus years early on the road to Damascus? He apprehended him. He took him captive so that he can give him something. And Paul is saying, that's what I'm going after, that glory that the Lord Jesus has for me. Now, in verse 14, this is what it means to be a joint with Christ. I press toward the mark, here's his goal, for the prize. There's a prize out there. And what is that prize? The calling of God in Christ Jesus. Is that what it says? No. What type of calling? High calling. The high calling. God just doesn't want you in his kingdom. He's called you to his kingdom and his glory. God rejoices in hope of the glory of God. That's what it's all about. Satan in these last days is trying to hinder that and hide that. But every day I, I read Paul's epistles and study, I see it more and more. So I'm going to bring out with you guys what I see. Now let's go back to chapter number 3, verse 1. So he says, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. We know the Lord is the righteous judge. Understand that everything we go through, he's going to give back to us. We're laying up in store. Okay, It's laid up for us, a crown of righteousness, if we're endured to the end in the dispensation of grace or our, or, or our uh, death in the mystery. Yeah. And then Paul, he says, it doesn't bother me to continue to write this. Look at that verse number one. To write the same things to you, to me indeed is not grievous. It did not, it did not grieve Paul to constantly remind them. And it doesn't grieve uh, any minister who understands this. It shouldn't grieve them to talk about it constantly. But for you, it is what? Safe. By the way, it's safe. Safety. Paul wants to save them from something. From what? Look at, look at the three things he wants to save them from. Beware of dogs. Now, he's not talking about the four-footed beast, but he's talking about some men, some heathen Gentiles, who act like those four-footed beasts. Ravenous dogs. Unclean. Those are the lost Jews. Those Gentiles, excuse me. He says, beware of evil workers. Those are the evil brethren in the body of Christ. We're going to see more about these evil workers. And then he says, beware of the concision. That's Paul's, that's what how Paul describes those lost Jews who had the physical circumcision, but not the circumcision in the heart. And God is a spirit, and they must worship, they which worship him must worship him how? In spirit and in truth, the Lord says in the book of John. So let's look at this issue of evil workers. But before we do, notice that's that, that chapter 3, verse 1 again. Finally, my brethren, now notice he says rejoice. As I'm looking at this, Paul mentions the word rejoice. Now, guess, guess what? Oh, I didn't tell y'all this, did I? No. The audience is like, look at Ron's handwriting. This is my, my daughter. Welcome, welcome to church. 
Wednesday. What is this? What did she say that was? I forgot. Anyway, Wednesday, <laughs> Jada from Viewers Like You. Thank you. She watches PBS from view, Viewers Like You. Thank you. <laughs> Look like Versus Lick You, but it's Viewers yeah, Like You. <laughs> I'm an interpreter. I'm sorry. I, didn't, I forgot to do that. Anyway, so there you go. But anyway, look here. When it, when it talks about this word rejoice, Paul mentions this word just in the book of Philippians. Maybe that's why I like it so much. Rejoice. It means to joy again and again. Again and again. Okay? Now, watch this. You know how many times he mentions the word rejoice just in the four chapters of Philippians? Nine times. Now, if you know your Bible, not, not Bible uh, numerology, but uh, Bible numerics, Nine in the Bible is the number of, that's the fruit of the Spirit. It's, the, it's, it's what the Spirit produces, what He produces. And what the produce of the Spirit is, it's that love in action, that love in action. You remember? That's what charity is. It's the only thing that's going to go on forever. Remember, remember the theme of our book. Go back to Philippians 1. Go back to Philippians 1. And notice in verse... Oh, Philippians verse one verse nine. Not even I didn't I didn't I just saw that. One nine. Philippians one nine. And this I pray. Here's Paul's prayer that your what love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. That's what it's all about. What the Spirit is going to produce is love that abounds toward one another, for the Lord and one another. So the fruit of the Spirit, what the Spirit produces in the grace believer, in the one who knows and loves the mystery, is that love in action. Now when you do that, you can then rejoice in the Lord, the righteous judge, the righteous judge, the Lord. You can rejoice in Him. When you're allowing the Spirit to produce that love in action for the Lord and those saints, nine times it's mentioned. Let's look at them. I just look at a couple of them. Look at... Um, Philippians chapter 2, verse 16. Holding forth the word of life, that I may do what? Rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labor in vain. Paul says, hold that word of the mystery of Christ forth, and when we get to the judgment seat of Christ, he will rejoice there. He will rejoice in the Lord. Uh, look at chapter number 2, verse 17. Yea, and I, if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I what? Joy and rejoice with you all. Notice Paul was happy to be a living sacrifice for the saints. We should too, right? That's what it's all about. Uh, look at verse 28. Chapter 2, verse 28. I sent him, that's Epaphroditus, therefore the more carefully to, to Philippi, that when ye see him again, ye may rejoice. And that I may be the less sorrowful. So you can see the theme. Rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. Joy again. To rejoice is to show that you're very happy and have great delight. And nine times throughout that epistle. Let's look at a couple more. Look at chapter 4, verse 4. Philippians 4 and verse 4. Maybe that's why I like it. You can't read this book and study it without seeing this rejoicing. 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. That's in every way. And again, I say what? Rejoice. Look at verse 10. There's two right there. Right in, one, in two and the same one verse. Yeah. Look at verse 10. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you were also careful that you, had, you lacked opportunity. They started providing for Paul again. The point is, rejoice, rejoice, rejoice is the issue. Now, in order to rejoice in the Lord, you have to beware of some things. So go back to chapter 3, verse 2. So beware of those lost heathen Gentiles, ravenous dogs, unclean and, and, and ready to devour the prey. Beware of evil workers. <coughs> that word beware means to be careful. <coughs> you're in trouble. You're in danger. You better be careful. Let's look at that. Go back to the book of Luke. Let me show you Luke 6. Uh, go back to Luke 5, 12. Luke chapter 12. I was thinking the Lord Jesus Christ did the exact same thing during his earthly ministry. The Lord would, he would always warn the little flock of all those around them who would try to get them to leave his word. Look at Luke chapter 12 and verse 15. 
Look what the Lord Jesus says to the little flock. And he said unto them, Luke 12, 15. Now, here he's, he used the word take heed, but that's a warning. That's saying beware. Take heed, and well, there it is, and beware of what? Covetousness. You have to beware of being covetous. Why? For a man's life consisted not in the abundance of the thing, things which he possesses. Um, what did the Lord say? What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet lose his own soul? We just saw uh, this movie, Chris Dye and Jada Lynn, called Annie. And we've been watching it because Jada Lynn wants to watch it over and over and over. My mother took it to see it. Uh, Vanessa went with her children to That's see it. We, we see it. And I mean, it is. It's a musical and all that, but I, I didn't think I would like it. But in there, you you know the old Annie, Daddy Warbucks, well, the new guy's name, uh, Mr. Stacks, he has a billion, four billion dollars. And out of all his billions, he was alone. He had nothing that, that, that thrilled his heart. Until this little 10-year-old girl, Annie, came into his life. And he was willing to give up all his buildings for that one little girl. And what that was showing is, out of all his abundance, he really had nothing. That's what this is saying. Look at chapter 12, verse 15. Take heed and beware of covetousness. Now, obviously, this is in, in, in relation to the Lord. For a man's life consisted not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. All right. Go with me, if you will, to Luke chapter number 20. Go over to Luke chapter number 20. So I just want you to see, even the Lord Jesus, he would warn his little flock about things that they should beware of. Uh, notice in chapter 20, verse 46. Verse 46, beware of the scribes. Now the scribes were... Uh, a part of the religious leadership of the nation of Israel, okay? They would be scribe, uh, scribe the law, write the law, or copy the law, which desire to walk in long robes. You know what religious dudes like to do? Walk in long robes, okay? And they love greeting in the markets. Oh, hi, rabbi. Hi, pa uh, pastor. Hi, father. This and that's what they love. In fact, they wear all this stuff so that they can be seen in the markets. Okay? You know, the markets is just out in public. But not only that, when they gather together, notice, and the highest seats in the synagogues. When they go to their religious festivals, they want to get right where everybody can see them. They want to put chairs right on stage and sit there so everybody can see them. You know what the Lord says? When somebody bids you to a feast, Go find the lowest place. Go into the back. Just go into the back in the corner. Don't, don't come right up front and be seen. Go way in the back so that the guy who invites you says, Hey, what are you doing back there? Come on up here. And then you receive worship from everyone. Okay? See, who, he who abases himself shall be exalted. That was what he's saying. Not these religious guys. They like to set their chairs up there and be seen by everybody. Notice, and the chief rooms at feasts. They had these different rooms. They, 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 by the way, I'll tell you something you can understand. This is Luke chapter 20, verse 46. Um, I'm from the hood. They, they got these clubs. And they got what they call the VIP section, right? And what they do is they rope it off. And you people, you lowly people, us lowly people, we can't get in there unless we, you know, somebody. And that's how they did in their religiousness. They had cheap rooms at these get-togethers. And everybody said, ooh, who's back there? Oh, yeah, such and such. Well, forget about all that. Look at verse 47. These guys devour widows' houses. Paul says it over here. He says, they creep in the houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins. Here, they devour widows' houses. They take all that these widows have. And for a show, they make long prayers. They get out there. They put their rug out there. They get out there, they have their beads. They get out there, they have their collars, and they just make these long prayers. Honey, remember when we first met? That guy got up there. I can't remember what it was. And he was like, oh, eternal spirit. The guy had his little robe. And he was, the people were looking at him. He was like, oh, eternal He was getting all into it. I, I, that's that guy. For a show, he just made some long goofball prayer. He, oh, eternal spirit. Didn't get a Lord Jesus anyway. Anyway. The same shall receive what type of damnation? Greater. Greater. I think, Don, you asked me originally. Those guys, who the religious leaders are held to a higher standard, see? Because they're leading people down 
to hell, or the perdition. So we're going to have a lower place in hell. Sure he will. And, 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 and what Christ is warning his people is, beware of these guys. These are good passages for you, for you guys to use when you're out there. Tell people, these religious leaders out there, you've got to beware of these guys. They judge first. Yeah, they judge first. Go over to Colossians chapter 2. Let me tell you what Paul says about beware. Again, Colossians chapter number 2. The first thing people see when they come here, they're underwhelmed at where, what we make, where we meet. It's always been that way. Minnesota has been that way. In Chicago, anywhere where grace, people are, un, un, they're used to seeing like a big building and a, and a big steeple and all this other stuff. And they come, we live in this little room. It's just like, really, what's going on here? But see, don't, don't look at that outward stuff. What's being taught? The, the truth of God's word. Look at Colossians chapter number two and verse eight. Beware lest any man spoil you. That's take what's yours. How? Through philosophy. Philo means lover. Sophia means wisdom. And they're lovers of human wisdom. And what? Vain deceit. They're going to deceive you and it's going to end up vain as far as your profit at the judgment seat. After the tradition of men, that's the way they do it. We've been doing it this way in our religion. I had 90-year-old people tell me every day, I was born a... a, a a Catholic, I'm going to die a Catholic. I say, you sure will. You sure will. I was born a... Yep, you're going to die that. Tradition. Because they don't want to hear that you can't do anything to please God in and of yourself. You have to come through the Lord Jesus. They just want to have their tradition. And he says, after the rudiments of the world, they want to do it how the world system does it. The elementary things of the world. And not after who? Christ. By the way, beware lest any man spoil you. What is it that that man can take away from you if you allow? Your reward. That's exactly right. And by the way, if Paul says beware, beware that you can be spoiled, if the reward of the inheritance is automatic, let's just reason for a second. Let's not be, a, if it's automatic, okay, some people think it is. What can you be spoiled out of then? If it's automatic, and it was by, by, by grace through faith plus nothing. You got it. There's no, there's no reason to be spoiled. There's no reason to be weary of being... Uh, it's not automatic. It's beware lest any man spoil. But you got to listen to Paul to get that. You know how you know? Look over to chapter 3. Verse number 23, Colossians. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the righteous judge, to the Lord. And not unto men. Why? Knowing that of the Lord, of the righteous judge. You know when Paul says, the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me that crown of righteousness. That's what he's talking about. Knowing that of the Lord, he shall receive the reward of the inheritance. For you serve the Lord Christ. The righteous judge who suffered and now is glorified. He's going to share that with you. That's what it means to be a joint heir. Paul says in, in, in uh, Acts chapter 20, Now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you a, a, an inheritance. He's talking to some people who already have an inheritance. They're already heirs of God. They have heavenly places and they have a new body already the moment they trust Christ. But if you listen to the grace of God, the mystery, he will give you an inheritance. He'll give you something. It's that. It's the reward of the inheritance. And that has to do with being a joint, equal in heir, in, uh, uh, heir with the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and why does he say joint heirs with Christ? Because that means you suffer and you get glory. You suffer in glory. So that's all put together. Let's look at some more. Let's look at this issue of evil works. Go back to Philippians chapter number 3 again. Philippians chapter 3. Now what are these evil workers? Well, the evil workers are those brethren in the body of Christ who reject the good works of the sanctified grace believer that we're to walk in. Ephesians 2.10 says, We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. These are members of the body who say, I don't care about that Pauline grace message. I'm going to do it my way. Go over to uh, Titus chapter number 1. Let me show you that. So evil workers are saved people, enemies of the cross of Christ. 
For those listening, we have a whole message on the enemies of the cross. Listen to that. He's not talking about lost people. He's not talking about dogs. He's not talking about the surf of the concision. He's talking about your own brothers and sisters in Christ who reject the Pauline grace message. Look at Titus chapter number 1, verse number 16. They profess that they know God. They're professing believers here. But in works, they do what? Deny him being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. So instead of doing the good work, they're doing evil work, okay? Now, here's a warning from the scriptures. Go back to the Old Testament. Go to Ecclesiastes. Uh, if you're around, if you find Psalms, Proverbs, all that, Ecclesiastes is, is uh, Solomon's other book. Ecclesiastes, and I want you to get chapter number eight. Let's go back to the Old Testament. I want to show you a principle. This is an interdispensational principle in Scripture. Ecclesiastes, it's hard to find because it's kind of stuck in between. Song of Solomon, Proverbs. If you find Psalms, you find Proverbs. Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon right there too. You got it? All right, good. Dorothy, no, you spend time around us. I see people when they first come and they got those tabs on their Bible and I say, please ask they got or oh, they looking, looking, looking. But if you spend time with, you know what, you start to learn where everything is. By the way, you start to learn your Bible, you say, oh, okay, that's right there. You kind of get it. Every once in a while, somebody will just do that, and they, they give it right on there. Boom, right? I do that. Yeah, okay, I know. It happens sometimes. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter number 8, verse 11. Why do people just go about their lives, and you, you can see that they're evil workers. They're rejecting the Pauline grace message. They're believers, but they're, they're in the body, but they're, they don't believe the message. And, they, and they're evil workers. Well, there's a reason, because we live under God's grace, okay? God is not just going to punish you right away. He's going to wait to that great day called the judgment seat of Christ. But, but see, here's the principle about life when it comes to evil. Verse 11. Because, what's that next word? Sentence. See that word, sentence? Somebody asked me, what are we going to be doing at the great white throne as members of the body of Christ? Did I say that right? Great white throne. Yeah, the body of Christ is going to be there. Oh. Yeah. Remember, we're going to be You're judges. Judging, yeah. Ruling. We shall judge angels. We shall judge the world. First Corinthians six. Okay. That's we're going to be said. there. Not he, We're not going to be judged. Well, we're going to be I judging. Mean, that's where I was. All right. Sorry about that, Dorothy. She's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to be there. Yeah, you're going to be there. You're going to be sitting there in there judgment. That, so. First, First Timothy six. King of kings, Lord of lords. It's going to be Lord Dorothy. Lord Doty, she's going to be judging. But see, here's what we're going to do. Basically, what the great white throne is, is handing down sentences. Judges hand down sentences, right? Yeah. Judges. Whatever your crime is, the judge looks at the evidence and say, for that, I remember Bernie Madoff, who stole all that money, they gave him some ungodly amount of time, like 800 plus years, I don't remember, it was crazy, he couldn't live that long. And they asked the judge, why did you give him a, a sentence that could not be carried out? The man's in the 70s, whatever. He goes, I wanted the record, when, when they write up the, the judgment, I want the record to reflect the grievousness of his sins. He took advantage of elderly. He took advantage of other, he took so advantage, so we gave him 900 years in, in prison. We say, well, how can they do that? Well, because that's a picture of the judgment of the great white throne. People are going to just be in certain spots of the lake of fire for all eternity based upon their sin, we're going to hand down sentences. That's what the righteous judges do. All right, let's keep going. But until the Lord does that, notice how humanity works. Because sentence against an evil work is not executed how? Speedily. Because God just doesn't come in and just the moment you do something, get you. What do, what do hard-hearted human beings do? Watch this. Therefore, the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do what? Evil. Evil. Remember what the Lord said at the, at the flood? He says, he says, man's heart is just only evil continually. 
It grieves God that man is just so evil in their heart. Well, that's it. Well, one day when the Lord Jesus comes, sets up his kingdom, it won't be this playing around with stuff, okay? At the great white throne, he's going to be handing out stiff sentences. But for now, that's what's going on. Go down to uh, chapter number 12. Go to Ecclesiastes chapter number 12. Now, Solomon was the wisest man that ever lived before the Lord Jesus. Who was the wisest? <clears throat> after the Lord Jesus, who was the wise? Who, who do you think was the wisest man? Um, okay, I'll give, I'll give you guys a trick question. Solomon. No. Oh, no. Who, was the, who was the wisest man that ever lived? Don't count the Lord Jesus because he was the God man. One greater than Solomon came, he said, right? So up to the Lord Jesus, Solomon was the greatest. But he says one greater than Solomon is here. No. no. Who was the wisest man that ever lived? No. After Paul. Paul. He had the mind of Christ. So, you know why, Dorothy? Everything Solomon knew about the Holy Scriptures, the Old Testament, Saul knew, right? But what did Saul, Paul, know that Solomon had no clue about? Revelation. The revelation of the mystery. Bam. Right. Paul knew it all. Each and every one of us standing here, we're wiser than Solomon because we know something about what God's doing that Solomon didn't know. Solomon, you know what it says about Solomon? He knew everything about the earth and all this other stuff. He understood about God's plan and purpose with the nation of Israel. He was the only king that had, oh. And then look what he did. Well, yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> he's human. Like his daddy David. He had 40 years. Now check this out, guys. It, it's amazing. Of peace. His name literally means peace. Shlome, uh, Shlome, or Shalom, so Salome, Shalom. Solomon means peace. Do you understand? The whole time he was king in Israel, he had peace from his enemies. Now he's a type of the Lord Jesus Christ in his kingdom. Not even David had that. David was always warring with the Philistines. Solomon had peace. You know what it said? I think it said something like this: that God just set his his enemies around about and just quiet them. Just be still. They were so overwhelmed with the, with the glory and wisdom of Solomon. God did that for Solomon to show a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what did he do? You're right. He ended up messing things up. But before he did, Dorothy, the, the, the word Ecclesiastes, okay? You see Ecclesia and all that. The, what that is, the preacher. Okay? The preacher. That's what it means. Now, Solomon wrote that? Yes. Ecclesiastes, the preacher. In his old age. So Dorothy, he, he left the Lord, but he came back, right? But let me tell you what the preacher is. Now, how does Paul define preaching? Colossians 1. Yeah. Warning every man and what? Teaching every man. Now watch this, everybody. A preacher's job is to warn and teach. Let me show you what he says in chapter 12, verse 13 and 14. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, 14. That's how you remember Watch this. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. What's life about? Number one thing in life, fear who? God. There's no one. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter number 12, verse 13. You got it? Okay. Sorry about that, Dorothy. Let us, so, so what I'm saying is Solomon, Dorothy mentioned how Solomon, after all that the Lord did to bless him, the man had a thousand women, 700 wives, 300 concubines, okay? And he was peaceful? <laughs> Not really. I just said his enemies weren't messing with him. <laughs> I, when I say peace, peace from the outside in, not from the inside out. Being around all the women, sorry, huh? Many of them was led. In fact, the strange women actually led him away from the Lord. That's how he ended up going into hell worship. Okay, here's my point. He had he had he had rest from his enemies, but in his house it was chaos. Right. All the women and children. But he learned something. He learned something. Ecclesiastes means a preacher. It means to warn and teach. In Ecclesiastes 12, 13, 14, Solomon, as an old man, is going to tell the young Israelite, yea, any man, who now listens. Here it is. Verse 13, chapter 12, verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. What is life about? Number one, fear God. 
If I had a son on my dad that I said, son, two things. Fear God, keep his commandments through the Apostle Paul. Honor your mom, take care of your mom and your sisters. There you go. Serve the Lord. Because that's what Solomon's doing. Number one, fear God, and now under the law, and keep his commandments. Now the commandments in, in here was the Old Testament commandments of Moses. But if we had to take that interdispensational principle and apply it to our dispensation, where do we find the commandments of the Lord for us? In the mystery. 1 Corinthians chapter number 14, verse 37, Paul says, If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things I write unto you are the what? Commandments of the Lord. Everybody thinks the commandments just the Old Testament, but they're not. There are some grace commandments. We're under grace. We're not under the law, but we are under grace command. All right. So for that today, keep his commandments through Paul. Here we go. Anything else? Dear wise Solomon? Nope. Verse 13. For this is the whole what? Duty of man. Why did God create man? To fear him and keep his commandments. Now when you do that, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, why would I do that? What does it matter? Um, <laughs> you can't talk about good works without talking about consequences. Let me show you something. Grace is, yes, it's unmerited favor, undeserved kindness. It's God's riches at Christ's expense. It's all that. But let me give you a broader definition from Scripture. God dealt with Adam uh, by grace. It means freedom or liberty. Freedom. I'm going to say liberty. Liberty is a better word. By the way, just like work, I'm going to show you all something I learned this week from studying Paul again. I always learn something. I'm going to show you the difference between work and labor in a second. There's a, there's a difference. Yes, I do. <laughs> Yeah, because you're here, you, you're louder than. Uh, I mean, no, no, but I, but I can hear you. Yeah, because you're. I talk loud too because I'm half deaf in one ear. Okay, grace. But let me tell you what it, it's the difference between freedom is this. I'm going to use the word liberty. Here's why. Freedom means. Imagine when the slaves were free, they were let go. They were they were out of the chains saying, okay, go, you're free. But because they didn't have any land and they didn't have anything, many of them actually went back to their white owners because they're like, I'm better off with you than just out there. I would die. That's freedom. Technically, you're not in bondage, but really you are. We, we're not freeing you up financially. What liberty is, because God gave the, 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 the Israel the year of jubilee, the year of release, if you had a Hebrew servant, you would free them in that 50th year or whatever, and then give them land. Reparations. Restore their land. Now they are not only free, but they're at liberty to serve God in their inheritance. That's the difference. So, for example, you could set the slaves free. Many of them didn't have anywhere to go, so they went back. Or you could set them free and say, now we're giving you guys 40 acres and a mule. Go ahead. You know, like Spike Lee wanted. Well, that's, that's true liberty. Grace is that. It's liberty. You can serve the Lord. You're free in Christ to serve, but it has consequences. Uh, uh, responsive. Thank you, Mother. You're responsible now and with accountability or consequences. For example, God told Adam what? Adam, you're free to eat of all the trees of the garden but one. There's his responsibility. Don't eat of that one tree. Okay, Lord, I'm going to eat anyway. What you going to do? Well, there's a consequence, Adam. What was the consequence? In the day that thou eat thereof, thou shalt what? Surely die. There's the consequence. That was God's grace. So the same way today. Under God's grace, notice how Paul, how, excuse me, how, how Solomon puts it here. Now this is the law, but the same principle. Look at chapter 12, verse 14. Why you have to fear God and keep his commandments? Why is that the whole duty of man? That's the reason we exist. F-O-R means further explanation. For God shall bring every work into what? Judgment. Through the Lord Jesus, by the way. Well, is he just talking about the things that we do out in the open? No. And every secret thing, he's going to read your heart. Whether it be what? Good. Or whether it be evil. 
So the point is, God is just going to weigh your evil and your good, man. And he's going to, if you're lost, he's going to hand down that sentence for the lake of fire. Now, what about saved people in the dispensation of grace? Well, if, you, if you're an evil worker in the body, when you get to the judgment seat of Christ, he's going he's gonna to weigh your evil works and you're going to lose reward. No, you are going to be judged. It's the judgment seat of Christ. This is a judgment. I thought you've already been judged at the cross. For that's, salvation. That's for, our, for, our sin. for salvation. Not our works. Right. Okay. 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 No, huge. This is great. No, that's why I love Dorothy's question because I want, she gives me an opportunity to kind of expound. The judgment is twofold, Dorothy. There's the positional judgment, right? Everything, you guys have to remember this. Everything is, number one, positional and practice, right? Practical or practice. You have to rightly divide. Okay, so the word, let's say the issue of judgment. Dorothy's right. When you trust the Lord Jesus Christ at Calvary, positionally for your salvation, you were judged, right, in him. God judged your sin, Dorothy, right. the eternal penalty in Christ. That's what I'm saying. But you still have a life after salvation. Right. You still sin. Same. We still sin. Remind me in 1 Timothy chapter number 6 so I can show you that. Now, what I'm talking about, Dorothy, at the judgment seat of Christ, that's your practice. How are you living? Sanctification. Bam. And Paul calls some believers in Philippians 3 evil workers. Where are our brethren and sisters who are evil workers? Where they're going to be judged is the, the judgment seat. That's why I don't even call it the Bema seat, judgment seat of Christ. Here's why. The Greek word for judgment is Bema. And I understand some people do it to, to, to separate it from other judgments in Scripture. But when you take the word Bema in place of judgment, it takes out that issue of judgment. It, it kind of softens it, right? Ah, oh, it's just an award ceremony. No, it's not. It's the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. That, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5. Forget the word Bema. Use the word what it is. The righteous judge. Judgment. Okay, so everybody get that. Don't soften it. That's what it is. Your practice. Now go with me if you will. So that's the whole duty of man. Go with me if you will to First Timothy chapter six. My heart aches. My my body it just it, it it irks me to no end when I hear dispensational teachers. say that your sins aren't the issue at the judgment seat of Christ. Now I know what they I know what they mean. They're saying as far as the eternal penalty of your sins, as far as keeping you out of heaven, you're saved by God's grace. They're talking about position. They mix up position and practice. But let me show you what Paul says about sins. Watch this. Look at 1 Timothy chapter number 6. Oh, excuse me, chapter 5, chapter 5. Verse 24. This is in context of the body of Christ. If, if, if a preacher, if a teacher, because a preacher would warn you, teachers, if a teacher would say, your sins are not the issue of the judgment seat of Christ, I would tell them, you don't know what you're talking about. I watched this show about the Lord Jesus during his earthly ministry, and he was sitting there listening to some goof teach in a, in a synagogue, some rabbi talking about God's word. And, and Jesus was sitting there just like this. He was going, no, no. And they're looking at him. I, I, it gave me so much strength. He was sitting there listening to this guy talk about the Bible. Here's the living word of God. He's sitting there all humbly. The guy was like, well, you know, blah, 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 blah. And Jesus sitting there going, no, no. Mm -mm. And people are looking at him like, who is this guy? And the Lord is just like, no. That verse, and he just expounded. They look at him like, this guy, who is this man? I would say that. If I heard a preacher say, your sins are not the issue of the judgment of Christ. No. Paul says, let's look at it. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 24. Some men's, what? Sins are open beforehand, going before to judgment. He's not talking about lost people. He's talking about the, the body of Christ in context. The point is, Paul says, hey, 
Some guys, like the guy in 1 Corinthians 5, you can see that this dude is just out there. These, these evil workers are out of, out of hand. That stuff is gone. But what about the ones that are done in secret? Well, keep reading. Verse 24. Some men's sins are open beforehand. You can see them. Going before to judgment, to the judgment seat. And some men they follow after. These things follow you. Later. Uh huh. It's saying at that rapture. Unrepentant. Let me let me let me preface this, guys. Unrepentant. God gives you space to repent. Let me tell you, man. I'm learning about the Feast of Tabernacles because there's a there's a that that's just where the the trumpet is blown. Sorry, sorry, sorry. The feast of trumpets when it's blown, uh, the rapture could very well take place on a on a feast of trumpets or whatever. And I'm and I'm looking at. The, the, the details of it. Matt and I were looking at this and we're seeing some things. And one of the things that, that it, it's, it's the trumpet saying, in these last days, it's coming, guys, it's coming. And God has given us space to repent as believers. But if you don't, that's what that verse is saying. Some men, they follow after. But what about the good works? Can I tell you, grace believers, please, understand that even if you don't get glory now, just wait on it, because look at the next verse. Likewise, also the what? Good works. good works of some are manifest beforehand. You can see it. I can point out to you guys good works here and there. But there's some people and some things you guys do. There's some people who are behind the scenes. Chris and I always talk about this one brother. It's a number of brothers out in Twin Cities. But one guy named Brother Mike Finnegan. People would, on Sundays, you know, he, he'd come on Saturdays. He would not only clean up. He would, he, would, he would buff the floors, do the garbage, fix, make sure the fridge is stocked with water. He'd do all of this. Nobody knew. We walked in on one time, or after a men's meeting on a Saturday or something, and I came. He was doing all this. Nobody knew but God. And I thought of that verse. I go, Brother Mike is doing all this. Nobody knew. Verse 25. Likewise, also the good works of some are manifest beforehand. You can see some of here it is. And they that are otherwise cannot be hid. The things that Mike was doing for the ministry's sake, only the Lord knows. Everybody's going to see that at the judgment seat. Go to 1 Corinthians 4. And can I say the same thing for you? <laughs> Chris and I have the... One of the things in, in ministry, you have a blessing... This letter I, I read you guys the other day. Also, please inform Dorothy, Leonard, Jim, Matt, the rest of the congregation. I cannot name them all, but they are with us. We're with them in spirit. Inform Vanessa that our Google Plus page is very good. You guys didn't, I, I didn't even know these people. I, you guys didn't know how they felt. You're just doing your thing. And if some regular human beings can recognize and love you guys for just being here, being part of a ministry that they hold on to, what do you think the Lord sees? He's going to see, he sees all this. You, we're going to be rewarded for this if we continue on in, in the, 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 the labor of love. Take heed to the ministry which the Lord has given you that you fulfill it, he tells them. Okay, we got to be careful to fulfill it. Let's look at chapter 4, 1 Corinthians. Verse, verse 2. You've got to be found faithful when the return of the Lord. Verse 2. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. So when the Lord comes, he has to find you still in the mystery of serving. Anyway, look at verse 5 for time's sake. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come. Lord means righteous judge. Who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness. When he says those things cannot be hid, the Lord Jesus... Well, look at it. And will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. He's going to read our hearts. It's not just what we do, but it's why we do it. In that movie, Andy, now I'm going to be making Andy references there. Because <laughs> it's got a lot there. That rich guy, Stax, this is his name, like Warbucks. He was using this little orphan Annie. To get to get to win a mayoral contest, he was just oh take some pictures. He was just a politician, you know. He was he was he was he was giving her a place to stay. 
giving her everything she wanted. But really, it wasn't out of love at first. It was out of his own political advantage. To the outside world, it looked like, oh, look at this man taking care of this little poor orphan. The world says he's the greatest. But what God would have done had this man not fallen in love with Annie and actually adopted her for, for him out of love, God would have said, he would have said, see God, I took in the little girl. God would have said, but you did it for political gain, for your own selfish reasons, see? That's this. There are going to be men doing men. I, I, unfortunately, I know. There are going to be men doing ministry. Go over to Philippians chapter 1. They're going to be doing ministry, but can I tell you, they're only doing it for the praise of men. Sadly, I know some. And you can be in a dispensational position. I'm going to tell you, these people have been in a grace message for one year through our ministry. Let me show you, let me remind you guys what they said. Remember what they said about this? They noticed what's, what's, how people can do this. Um, try to see if I can remember. Let's see if I can remember. Anyway, he had mentioned the part. Okay, he goes. We understand that some who minister even as grace preachers serve not our Lord Jesus Christ. I am not directing this necessarily towards individuals, certain individuals, but we are sad to hear how they treated you that right and whatever. The point is, this brother recognized that just because they're called grace preachers or dispensationalists, their motivation and their heart attitude, especially towards others, is, is wrong. And let me show you something from the book of Philippians. Look at Philippians chapter number 1. Look at Philippians chapter number 1. Verse number 15. Some indeed preach Christ. How? Even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preach Christ of contention, not sincerely, Supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am... You know what? They were preaching the message, but because their heart was wrong towards the Apostle Paul, they're not going to be rewarded for it. That's important. He's going to bring forth not just what it looks like outwardly, why you're doing what you're doing. That's, can I tell you something? That's more important, I believe, from, from those scriptures. The heart that you have, that heart of faith, is more important than actually what you do. God is not saying, just get busy doing good works. He's saying, have the right heart attitude, and I'll do it through you, okay? All right. Now, as we um, we got about 15 minutes, I want to look at this issue of the evil workers from Paul's viewpoint. Go over to 2 uh, Second Timothy chapter 4. Let me show you an example. Uh, Benissa was asking about, like, an example of what it looks like for a man to to lead his family spiritually. We were talking about the man is the head and so forth, uh, or the woman and so forth. Well, when Benisa asked that question, she's looking for maybe a practical example from Paul about a man leading his family. The only one I could show, particularly, because it's the actions of, of the apostles that you, you can actually see stuff happening, was a man named Aquila. And Aquila, six times he's mentioned with his wife, Priscilla, and he's always leading his wife in the things of the Apostle Paul. They're busy serving God by serving Paul and the, and the saints. They have a church in the house. But I'm going to show you an example of an evil worker. Because, sadly, it's a bunch of them, and Paul got to always warn us of evil workers. Let's look at that. 2 Timothy 4, look at verse 14. Well, this one here, Mother, this, yeah, Alexander, here, yep, exactly. By the way, he always, he's mentioned them all over the place. In fact, after this, I'm going to show you a couple more. In every chapter, he mentions two dudes. Let's look at it. Chapter 4, verse 14. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. This dude's in trouble, y'all. And who's going to reward him? The Lord, the righteous George, the righteous George, the righteous judge reward. I'm saying judge and reward. The righteous judge reward him according to his. Hey, that judgment seat of Christ, that evil worker gonna get exactly what the, the Lord's gonna say. You treated Paul that way, I'm gonna give it to you. 
so many fold. What I told Krista, I said, if politicians realize the stuff that they do to people, God's going to do back to them like a sevenfold. Think about something. Everything you do to someone, the God's going to do is like more than that. He's going to do the same thing more than that. That makes you think twice about, oh, unrepented, I'm saying, okay? This Alexander, the coppersmith, you know, the, you know what Paul says? I'm not going to take it into my own hands. The Lord can do it better. The Lord will water according to his, to his works. Verse 15 now. Now, remember, Paul says to beware. So he's telling Timothy to beware of these, this guy. Notice in verse 15. Of whom be thou where? That word where, it's the, it's the way you say, of whom be thou be, beware also. Of whom be thou where also, for he hath greatly withstood our what? Words. When you withstand the words of the Apostle Paul, that's what makes you an evil worker. Let me say that again. The definition of an evil worker is a member of the body of Christ who withstands the words of the Apostle Paul. Do you guys know anybody like that? Yeah. Have you guys ever talked to a believer and shared this stuff about the mystery and what Paul said? And they go, ah, that's nonsense. Get that out of here. You're dealing with an evil worker. I follow Jesus. Yeah, you guys follow oh, Paul. Awesome. You guys worship Paul. I, they say. I know, then they say we, yeah, but they say it like that. But guess what? We're to, we're to not oppose the words of the Apostle Paul. We're to say the things that Paul writes are the commandments of the Lord. What I'm saying is when you guys talk to those believers, professing believers, and they withstand the words of the Apostle Paul, that's an evil worker. Right there. They all say they're believers. Yeah. Here's a scary one. Look at verse 16. 2 Timothy 4, 16. At my first answer, he means as he was on trial, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. Oh, Lord. I pray, God, it may not be laid to their charge. I'm go I, I, look, I, this is the only verse like that, so I, I don't have much light more than what I can see from other verses, you know, in my mind. What I'm thinking is, what they did to the Apostle Paul was so grievous that these men were, they were initially grace believers. They were, they, they believed in mystery, they were with Paul. But when they forsook him, like Demas, that, that sin was so great that what I, I'm going to tell you what I think. I think they would have lost the reward of the inheritance. So are they going to be suffering? And what now? Are they going to be suffering? Not just suffering loss, but suffering as in angst? It, 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 the angst of knowing they lost that eternal reward because of their not wanting to suffer in the mystery with Paul. Yep. Yep. That's it. Now, that's why I say in Benisa, when Paul says, I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge, I'm thinking Paul knows the loss that they're going to suffer if they don't recover themselves, right? right? He's saying, man, by them rejecting me at that moment when I need them the most, it's going to have eternal consequences. And I, I think he's saying, it's just me, I think he, he understands those guys are going to lose the reward of the inheritance. They are. You gotta suffer with the apostle. You gotta be in there with them, man. Is that why he says don't uh, hold it to their charge? Yeah, because Paul has compassion in his old age on him. He better than me. Yeah. <laughs> me and Krista, we talk all the time. People been we, all we done is give our life for, to build up ministries inside him, and people forsook us and stuff. We say, Lord, give them. Give them. But then look what Paul says. But that's the maturity. I know. Here we go. <laughs> it, it, it takes the heart of the Lord himself to say, yeah, Lord, you just handle it. Because we want the Lord to give them suckers. Lay it to their charge and make them lose, you know. That's, that's what you want to do when you're here. Right. But Paul, you know what? He was, you know, he'd he been through all of this stuff. And you kind of get there at the end, like, yep, that's what people do. Lord, lay it to their charge. But see, let me tell you something. In two different things, he tells, he tells, when it comes to Alexander, Paul does want the, you know, Paul didn't, by the way, Paul did not pray intercessory prayer for Alexander. This guy was just constantly attacking the apostle in God's word. And Paul don't have any, everybody see the difference? 
Paul has no sympathy when you're just opposing the word. He is leading it, or these are the people who got weak. Right. And we've seen that. You get the ones who lead the opposition and some who just kind of sheep behind them. It's them. <laughs> That's what it is. <coughs> the one who's leading it, Lord, get them. Those simpletons who just follow behind them, uh, well. What I think happened was these people were so afraid to stand with Paul, they were just like, oh, I don't know what to do. Okay, we just, no, 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 stick with me. But Paul understood something. That's what, that's what Dorothy was saying. Look at verse 17. Notwithstanding who stood with him, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. My grace is sufficient for you, right? That by me, the preaching, the warning, the teaching of the mystery might be fully known and that all the Gentiles might hear. He, that whole Roman Empire heard the word of God's grace. And that us today. Us today too, yeah. If it's true in his day, how much more today, right? right? right. It, it made it. The Roman Empire was in Europe. It came across right. the Atlantic it, the, all the way from one side of the United States yes, to the other. Yeah. All right. So here, here we go. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Now, the lion could be symbolic for Satan, but he never used that. He literally means <clears throat> one of the ways that the, the I'm going to say it like this, Christians. That was a derogatory term by the Romans for anybody who followed Jesus Christ. Whether you were a Jew in a little flock, or a Jew, Jewish man in the body, or a Gentile. Anybody in that Roman Empire that named the name of Christ was called a Christian. A couple of ways that Christians were, were uh, a few ways the Christians were killed back there was Nero would put them on fire. When he, burned, he burned down Rome, and, and Nero was the one who killed Paul. He burned down Rome, and he blamed the Christians, do what I'm saying, and he burned them, okay? Made them candles. You ever heard of a Roman candle firework? Yeah. You know where that comes from, right? Christians were Roman candles. He'd use them to light up the, the place. That's where a Roman candle comes from. But then, I know, but that's why ISIS did that. They did that to a pilot. They burned him alive. Well, Nero was doing that. Then they would have him fight the gladiators and have these men just beat them to death. Or lions. They'd feed them to the lions. Like Daniel's in the lions then. But if you were a Christian, but a Roman citizen like Paul, they would, they would cut your head off. That was more humane. Cut your head off. Here you were suffering, here you were suffering, here you were suffering. Here it was quick and easy. So Roman citizens who were who were given the execution had their head cut off. Quick. Right. But if you were a Roman citizen and a Christian, same thing. But what happened, here's what Paul, Paul was worried about that. They wanted to make a spectacle out of the Christian. So understand, that's what Paul was dealing with, okay? Now, verse 8, 18. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work. And that evil work, what did we learn what an evil work is? With yeah. yeah. He's not going to allow anybody to, to keep the word of God through Paul out. And like Dorothy said, it got all the way around the world. Right. And will preserve me unto his what? Heavenly kingdom. Yes. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, so coming down to the end, I just want you to see the evil work had to do with these guys who were believers, but withstanding the Apostle Paul like Alexander, okay? A uh, couple more guys. Let's go, go to, go to um, 2 Timothy chapter 1. Second Timothy chapter number 1. Verse 15. So, Vanessa, although we don't have many practical examples about the man besides, like, uh, leading his wife, besides... Uh, Besides our, our, our man uh, Aquila, 2 Timothy 1, 15. We don't have many practical examples outside of Aquila who leads his wife spiritually yeah, in, the, in the scripture. We have an abundance of evil workers. Let me give you some. We just saw Alexander. Let me show you another one. Verse 17, chapter 1, verse 15. Sorry. This thou knowest that all they which are in Asia, that's present day Turkey, Asia Minor, be turned away from me, Paul, of whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. Like Krista was saying, these two brothers in the Lord, 
Phygelus and Hermogenes was leading the charge of rebellion against the words of Paul. The only assembly, this blows my mind. People say, Brother Ron, there ain't a lot of grace churches. No. We've been looking and looking. No. There was only one grace church in all of Asia Minor at that time. Timothy's. So don't y'all, don't seem like it's a marvelous thing that we could be the only grace church in this whole section of California, okay? There's a dispensational church down in Southern California. You just won't learn anything about the higher truths of sanctification and joint heirship. But I only know of two assemblies in the entire state of California that even talk about Paul as your apostle in the mystery. One down in Southern California and us. That's it. But imagine a whole continent where there was one church that stayed with the Apostle Paul. Let's look at that verse again. Verse 15. This thou knowest, that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me. And they were led by Phagellus and Hermogenes. Go over with me to um, chapter number 2. Go over to chapter number 2. Verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. How do we study the Bible? Rightly dividing the word of truth. That's, that's the entirety of understanding of God's word. Verse 16. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word will eat as doth a canker. You know how a cancer just eats through? The people whose words oppose Paul's, their word eats the body of Christ like a cancer eats through a human body. Destroys it. Will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. So here's two other evil workers, Hymenaeus and Philetus. Who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection, that's the rapture, is past already and overthrow the faith of the Son. Imagine something, guys. We're looking for the resurrection, the rapture, and two jokers are saying it already happened. You know what they say today? They say, these guys were saying it already happened. They, they were too early. You know what people do now? They put the, they put the rapture way out in the tribulation, either uh, mid-trib or post-trib, right? Yeah. They just do an opposite of these jokers. Those are evil workers, and they're evil workers today. Uh, let me see, he's got some in chapter 3. Yeah, he just talks about the, the evil worker. Verse 6, verse 5, uh, we'll end here. Chapter number 3, verse 5. Having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Don't listen to them. Get away from them. For of this sort of they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning them. Uh, oh yeah, here's the two guys. Verse 8. Now as Jannies and Jambres withstood Moses. Yeah. These guys come and they do trickeries on you. By the way, we got to end here, but remember our study from Sunday? The reason why the head of the woman is the man is because we saw women are more easily deceived, spiritually especially, the certainty of God, the certainty of God Eve. So these satanic dudes, they they seek out females. That's why they want, that dude looking at his wife, do you remember the, the letter? She's steady writing checks, he looking at her. <laughs> he even said, I was surprised that she didn't get it. Well, don't be surprised, she's the weaker vessel, she's your job to teach her. She was a... When the word silly is, 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 is like naive or vulnerable naive, right? She didn't, she didn't know any better. She was, she was bamboozled. That's why us men have to be the spiritual cover. We'll talk more about that on Sunday. Well, these guys just go and they, and they devour widows' houses. They attack the female like Satan because you guys are the weaker vessel. Us men, our bro your brothers in the Lord, our job is to protect you. But can't God give women discernment? He, he sure he does. So she just didn't discern what, what the pastor. You're was. you're no, you are no match match for 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 a man. A man. Okay. You know how I know. When did you learn the grace message? When did I learn? At what age? Was it my? Yeah. Was in the sixties. Mm-hmm. Men have been bamboozling you that whole time. 
I agree with that physically, Ron, but do you know that 97% of the people that Bernie Madoff that you were talking about earlier bamboozled were men? Why do you think that is? Because he, he, no, no, no. I'm going to tell you why it is. Because men are finance. more greedy than women. So that's a ch that's a th place where the woman should have been there before he wrote the check. And not only that, you know, you know, you know what Paul says: the only way men are deceived, deceiving and being deceived. Men are deceived when they try to see. A lot of the people that he got were rich men who were always looking to get over on them. They got they got God. Men are just naturally more greedy than women. It's just a fact. Powerful men are, are the heads of these companies. Not ain't a lot of women. Because women have more compassion for people. Yeah. Kristen, I, I mean, we, we, we find physicians and so forth. You go to male physician, most of them think they're God. You tell them about your own body. You know, I know, I, I take seniors every day. But I notice that the female physicians, they listen to the people. They're more compassionate about things. Women and certain things are better. But I'm saying the reason why those men get taken because they're trying to get something. They, they're more greedy than they got God. My point is, I, look, you, I'm telling you what the Bible says. You're talking about spiritually. Buddy. Especially spiritually, but, but in, in other things too. Other things too. What I'm saying is, the woman is the weaker vessel. In, in all parts of her being. Remember I always say, free Christ up here. There's no way that Krista will ever be stronger than me. It's just impossible because I'm still here. Physically. Physically. Right. right. Well, but, but, on, but, on a, but, but see, but, no, I'm, I'm not saying a woman could intellectually be smarter, born smarter. Mental. Some, some ladies can be like, you know, uh, uh, professor, you know, what I said, uh, you know, scientists and so forth. There's some smart women. But what I'm saying, spiritually speaking, God never intended a female to be on her own. It might be hard, people, but don't don't look at it the way the world does. You gotta have humility and understanding. But if you come up in the world and not in the be world, not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your Christians. Heart. I'm saying if you were brought up in the world, you would naturally. Well, sure, but that's why you need to listen to the word of God or somebody who knows the word of God. That's True. why we share the gospel. True. Listen. A man can survive on his own the policy of evil. He just has to get saved and get into the word. He, Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in a transgression. A woman was, wasn't created by God to be on her own, period. Okay, we got to end. I'll, I'll give you a great example. I'll give you a great example. If a woman lives on her own, they, they interview guys who break in and rape women. So, okay, I got to do this because it's the physical. They ask these guys, why her? Why her? Because she's living alone. And there's no man in there to stop me. I, I, I bypass houses where I see men going in and out. Her husband, her brother, her boyfriend. It, it, I got a fight on my hands. I look for weak women. When I say weak women, women on their own to attack. Why do they tell women who want to jog by themselves at night, don't jog by yourself. Don't walk around campus. Go two by two. Go with someone. Because men look for a woman. Salesmen. Don't ever go to salesmen, ladies, by yourself. They're going to take it back. They're looking. Just listen how God says it. God never intended for a female to be on her own. She's to have a covering. And the reason I'm saying in everything, in spirit and soul and body, listen, your daughters, I have a daughter. Your daughters can be bamboozled by any handsome little man who tells her what she wants to hear. It happens. Not when you get in your 80s, you learn. <laughs> okay, I'll give you that. I'll take your word for it. Thank you. But, unfortunately, Dorothy, if I tell you some of the things that happen at the senior home, <laughs> Ladies much older than you. Tell them, Krista. Let me. Uh, okay. And I've seen these men. Okay. You know, can I tell you what a guy told me today? A, a man told me today. I, I'm not even making this up. He says, he's like, hey, man, I, I tell the ladies. I, can I even say? I might be, I might be gray at the top, but basically his point was, 
There's a fire, there's a flame down below. below. That's what he told me. Right. I've heard that. This dude, and you know what? He he going out to all the way. And they're just like, oh, yeah. Come on now. He's taking advantage because many of them lost their husbands, their widow. <coughs> so what I'm saying is, I'll take your word for it. But for what I've seen for women in their 80s and 90s, they're just as vulnerable to sweet talk as, as they're your women. Well, the Lord has guided me. Yeah. Sure ain't no man out there who's sweet talking to you. I'm not going to tell. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell. I'll just and say. And you have men around you right, that you right. can go There's to. There's no middle and during her faith. Right, and that's the thing. And, and I understand. And that's the key. But you know what, Dorothy? That wasn't until you plugged yourself into a grace assembly that's constantly re- renewing your mind with the truth. Mm-hmm. No, I've always put my trust in the Lord. Mm-hmm. I don't yeah. live in fear. Well, good. I mean, I, I know what's around me. I right. lock my doors. I turn my alarm on. I right. do everything that's normally right. But I don't live in fear. But, and don't live in fear. But I'm saying you do have to. Can I tell you this? A woman on her own in every situation is more vulnerable to attack, whether it's spiritually, whether it's emotionally or physically, than when there's a man around. I can understand. And does that make sense, everybody? Yes. You know that in life. When, when Kristen J. Well, it depends on the man. But but we got to end. Mother, I got to see you. Let me talk about strength. We were living in Minnesota, and uh, Krista's cousin Molly is going to visit. By the way, our, our, our cousin Molly, or Krista's cousin Molly, my, my cousin by, by marriage, is going to visit California, right? When is she coming there? April. April something. So you guys are going to meet Molly. She's going to stay with us for a week. Very sweet young lady. Well, she was married in the past. And her husband was a little Tanzanian little guy from Tanzania, a real sweet guy named Jamil. Than that. He, he was this short, <laughs> maybe 100 and what? 100 and 20, 120, 20 pounds, that's what, right? Just a little, petite, little, tiny guy. And Krista lifts weights. And Krista, Krista, you know, is, 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 is bigger than him. Like that. She's, not that. She's bigger than him. He's just a tiny guy. And tell him, you guys were wrestling one day, right? Well, what did he do to you? Well, I was going to go after him. He just like grabbed me. He's the tiniest dude in the world. Yeah, he, he grabbed my life like this. Yeah. And she tried to break me. She couldn't. <laughs> His little tiny self was way stronger than my wife. My point is, just because he was a male, he, even though he was a tiny little petite dude that I could have picked up by one hand and threw across the room. <laughs> and if he, he and I got in a fight, I disgusted <laughs> him. My, he, he bear hugged my wife. She couldn't get out of it. She can get out of yours, yours, yours. She can get out of any females. Kristen's very strong. But that little 120-pound dude just did like that, and she was trying to... She, she told me, she was like, man, his, his, he was strong. And my point is, if, 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 he, if, if those two got into a fight, if he wanted to do my wife harm and I wasn't around, he would do some damage, even that little tiny guy. So the point is, there's just a difference between men and women in every way. That's what the Bible says. A man could be on his own... But a woman needs a covering. The head of the man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man. When I say on his own, humanly speaking, let me end like this. Every man, the only way a man is going to survive the policy of evil is to have the mind of Christ. But God has made it so that every man can get it. I'm going to say this. God has made it so that every man, every male can get into the word of God, if he's saved, and understand this book. But he has made it so even if a woman gets there, she's going to need some help from a man to grasp it fully. Did Eve have a perfect mind? Yes. Did she, did she not understand God's word fully? Yes. Let's end with this. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. I remind you ladies, no woman has ever had a perfect mind after Eve. And she was zero match against Satan. Let's end here. Verse number, chapter 2, verse 11. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. He's talking about in public, in the, in public ministry. Why? Why, God? For Adam was first formed, then Eve, the order of creation. And Adam was not, what? Deceived. Now, in verse 13, he called her Eve. In verse 14, he doesn't call her Eve. She is representative of all you females. Get that. 
He didn't say Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but Eve was deceived. No, 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 no. Look at verse 14. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman, that's you, being deceived, was in the transgression. Well, what was Adam? What was his part? We he hearkened to the voice of his wife. Genesis 3.17. And that's not weak? No. That's not weak? No. Why didn't he stand up? Why didn't he say to her? He loved himself more than he loved God's word. He loved the bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh, more than he loved God. All right, we got to hear. And if anybody uh, is out there and you never had anyone love you enough to ask you if you were to die today, do you know for sure where you're going to spend eternity? Um, I love you. That's why we're in ministry. These saints love you. By the way, we do appreciate hearing back from you, like these saints who appreciate our ministry. But more importantly, God loves you. And um, Paul says in Romans 5, verse 8, But God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You don't have to do anything to be positionally justified. It's by faith of Jesus Christ, your faith resting in what he did at Calvary. That's everlasting, no works. Now what happens after you're saved? Well, Dorothy, you mentioned it earlier, that's the sanctified life. That's the practical life. That's where the reward comes in. And to receive the reward of the inheritance, you have to serve the Lord Christ in the mystery. The Lord, the righteous judge Christ, the one who suffers for the mystery and is glorified together with him. We'll help you with that. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word of truth. We thank you for our time together. We thank you for your wisdom, Father. And it, it, is, a, it is a constant renewing of the mind, uh, both men and women, about how you have desired for things to operate. Because ultimately, it's the good pleasure of your will that we're to be concerned with. So may that be the, the goal of each and every one of us. Um, the woman in subjection to the man, but the man in his responsibility. Uh, although Adam did not was not deceived by the serpent, you held him responsible because it's his job to protect his wife spiritually. And so, Father, may we men do that for our sisters in the Lord. Uh, may we be worthy uh, from the word of God uh, in the mind of Christ to, uh, to lead uh, our, our sisters in the Lord in, in your truth. Because all of us, all of us men are going to be held accountable for our part in, in leading our sisters, as Paul said. So we thank you for that opportunity, that responsibility, that great responsibility. We thank you for the, uh, the power as men, the power of the Lord Jesus, who's our head, in accomplishing that. For your glory. We thank you for all this in Christ's name. Amen.